Good evening. Thank you so much for joining the Farming Podcast brought to you by Private Property. My name is Mbali Nwako, as always, your host, every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m., right here on the Private Property channel. Uh, thank you so much for choosing, choosing us as your preferred podcast. Not only is it the Farming Podcast, but all the other podcasts that we bring through to you um, from the Private Property home. We have Zama during the week and also SD. Then we have Chad over the weekend bringing you fantastic houses or homes rather that you could start browsing and start looking for a new space to live in. So um, thank you so much for your continuous support in all our different podcasts um, and most importantly the Farming Podcast um, as well because we want to turn you into, um, you know, turning your, your, your home garden into a, a sustainable food source um, and if you're starting a farm or growing a farm, um, again, the Farming Podcast is the place to be because we bring such exciting guests and bring you uh, awareness of the phenomenal entrepreneurs, farmers, professionals on the ground that we have in the agri-industry that is definitely bringing a lot more value into this beautiful sector that we all love. Today, I'm joined by two gentlemen um, who are entrepreneurs in this space, and they're going to tell us about data-driven farming. They've come up with a business that that is um, less than five years old and it involves drone and um, they'll tell us all about their technology. And what I like about this specific business is that it can you know, service any farmer um, irrespective of land size. However, you know, I would like the two gentlemen to obviously give us more detail into their business. And so if you have any questions or, or, or curious about how important data is in your farming operations and what exactly you can do with data, then this episode tonight is definitely one for you. So please feel free to comment, like, share, um, and obviously ask questions directly uh, to the guests this evening, which I will read out live, and uh, we will be happy to respond to whatever farming needs or specific topic needs that we're discussing this evening. So without further ado, let me introduce the team from Kurai, which is an agri-tech startup. And I am joined by Clive Mate, as well as Samuel Mateja. Gentlemen, how are you doing? And thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you so much, um, Bali, for, for, uh, for the introduction. And thank you for having us today. Well, good evening, Bani, and your guests. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So I want to start with Clive, perhaps. Um, how did you come about incorporating Kurai and why specifically did you bring this technology aspect within agriculture? Why couldn't you go for any other industry? So maybe tell us a bit about who or what Kurai is and why did you decide to uh, start your business in the agri-tech space? Thank you so much, Mbadi. Um, I mean, Kurai was born uh, from... Uh, more of uh, a passion project that uh, I and Sam had, obviously stemming from our historical experience growing up uh, more specifically in uh, the farming community. So growing up, I had access to a small-scale farm, obviously uh, actively involved in the activities in the farm. So, I mean, that could be something like weeding and, and crop, uh, crop spraying and pretty much just uh, trying to monitor and see if we can identify any uh, issues, right? And that was uh, 10, 15 years ago when I was still growing up. Obviously, uh, the whole thing changed. We went to varsity. Uh, I became an aerospace engineer, worked in the industry for quite some time. And we gathered quite a lot of uh, knowledge and experience, right? And as you might know, the aerospace industry is probably one of the sectors that really gets uh, access to tech way early on before any industry does. Mm -hmm. So that experience and the access to tech that it, it, it kind of gave us, and obviously mapping back to my experience is, um, I guess, a son of a farmer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it then became obvious that there was a need to then define value and push it back to the experiences that we had. Now, as we were forming Kurai, in our heads, it was value that we were creating that 10-year-old Clive was going to use and see value in. I mean, same we will probably speak more on the actual tech, how, how things work, and I guess how it then defines value for, for, for farms. Uh, but the whole idea is to push uh, the use of data, push the use of pretty much optimizing the, the, the access to resources that we have to, at the end of the day, um, increase productive efficiencies as a farm. Now, we, 
there's aspects, right, where we are seeing a farm as more of a social activity, more specifically for our small scale farms, but for us to be really productive and push the barriers to not only achieving food security, but then to then start uh, uh, deriving more profitability as a continent, there's need to treat a farm as a business. And if you're going to treat a farm as a business, it means there's productive relationships between inputs and outputs. And wherever there is such a relationship, we then speak of tech that optimizes the actual productive function. Uh, and that's pretty much what Kurai does, right? Is to push the productive efficiencies specifically for pre-harvest inefficiencies uh, aspects of the, of the farm. Okay, awesome. Sam, I'd like to come to you because uh, <clears throat> following with what Clive said, you know, he was born and bred, uh, he grew up, uh, in a farm uh, uh, environment, and I know you're more of the tech part, uh, uh, tech business partner in this relationship. And um, talking, uh, following up on what Clav has just said, you know, following up on data on your farm, how your farm runs, treating your farm like a business. What exactly does Karai do? Is it a product or a service to the farmer? And what exactly does it do? So, what type of tech do does um, Karai use? And how can it benefit my business? Cool. Uh, thank you for such a great question, Bali. So like Clive explained earlier on, technology is the best way to leapfrog uh, all the inefficiencies that are happening currently in uh, pre-harvest inefficiencies in, in farming. Uh, the way that correct technology works is that we work hand in hand with farmers, farm managers, and all the employees on the ground. We provide them with data-driven insights. Uh, we do this by using uh, high-tech sensors. So usually in the form of uh, drone equipment, we come to your farm, we you fly over your piece of land, any crops that you do have in the ground. We then aggregate all of this data, bring it back in-house, analyze it through machine learning processes. So basically that's just a fancy way that we pick out patterns and from these patterns, we can then deduce um, how any stresses that you might have on your crops, any watering issues that you might be experiencing, any pests that are possibly spreading and are going to affect your yields at the end of the day. So with this insight that is given to you in a timeless manner, you will then be able to act as a farmer and be able to uh, interject and as well as plan ahead for your season. Uh, I okay. think that's, yeah. Thank you for that. So tell me, what type of farmer should be using Kurai? Um, you know, uh, is, is it a farmer that's producing on open land? Is it a farmer that using, is pro, uh, producing under uh, crop protection, so tunnels, shade nets? Yes. What type of farmer is using, is, is using Kurai? So because we are using an aerial method to gather our data, we would inherently prefer open field crops, not under any shading or any protection. What usually happens is that we work with most of our clients during the, the summer periods. And then if, do, if farmers do then prefer to go into tunnels or cover their crops, we will then uh, are starting off thinking of employing other soil sensors, so sensors that stick in the ground to also be able to gather that data so that we can give you insights and input on how uh, your crops are performing and give you uh, data-driven actions to still help you reap a full harvest. Right. Still with you, Sam. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. You know, it's open field aerial mapping. That's, that's the purpose of your technology. Um, going back to the crops, are we talking mm -hmm. about tree crops? So if you're farming any fruit, citrus, et cetera, or um, can a farmer with maize or, or doing grains, producing grains, use uh, Kurai technology? Furthermore, can a farmer maybe farming vegetables, you know, if it's a crop that just lasts on the ground for three months, um, do you think it's still uh, uh, applicable for a, a vegetable farmer to use Kurai or is it just specifically for long-term crops? Oh, Mali, thank you. That's a very good question. So unlike... Uh, many of our other competitors out there, Kura is not limited to a single crop or a tree crop or a vineyard. Uh, we work across the whole uh, country, all the way from the Western Cape to Limpopo, dealing with grain crops, um, vegetables, 
vineyards, tree crops. Um, the analysis would definitely change uh, because the uh, pests and infections that are dealt with in tree crops are totally different to vegetables and vineyards. And we've spent the past couple of years working on our software and technology to accurately give customers the correct feedback. So yes, yeah. we have we do have uh, extensive experience with a whole variety of crops um, handled across the African continent. Great. Coming on to you, Clive, and I hope you can explain this in the most simplest uh, manner as possible. You know, um, maybe talk to a farmer. You know, I am a farmer, but yeah, as if you're talking straight directly to a farmer without using the high uh, tech jargon, et cetera, that's going to confuse us. So today I'm a maize farmer. I want to use Kurai to identify pests and diseases on my farm. How does it work? Um, am, am I flying the drone every single day? Is there a specific time that I need to fly? And then once it detects that, what happens? Um, so maybe just, just provide us like on the ground, how would one um, literally or physically interact and use Kurai? I think body for, for that question is quite, it's quite relevant. I think uh, also needful as well. Um, so how we work is we obviously uh, first build some kind of relationship with the farm in this case, some kind of contract uh, that obviously allows us to, to then come to your farm and start collecting data and, and, and the likes, right? Okay. Um, so depending on, on the crop, uh, it, depending on the crop, we, it, it then determines the actual frequency. So the, the number of times we come and collect data. Uh, obviously, if it's a more sensitive crop like, like lettuce, we'll probably then come to your farm every two weeks. Uh, if it's an open field crop like maize, we'll come to your farm every four to six weeks. Uh, the whole idea is to collect data at each and every different stage of, I guess, uh, the, the crop growth phase. And that does two things, right? The first thing it does is obviously tell us what's happening at that particular point in time. But then if you collect all the different time frames that we, we collect this data, you then start to see some kind of a pattern. Uh, on what's really happening in your farm, which areas are, are underperforming, uh, which areas are overperforming, and, and things like that. Mm. Uh, but the bigger picture in why we why pretty much is called um, crop monitoring, right? Is so that you kind of detach from being worried with what's happening on your farm. Um, so you can detach with aspects of uh, pest infections, for instance. You can detach with, with with any aspect that is related to your crop being your crop yields being threatened by any uh, crop stress or it can be heat stress or dehydration stress. Now, you, if you have detached all those factors to cry and cry because of the contract that has been set up or come to your farm in that frequency, which is obviously determined by the crop, and rest assured you know that if any of those issues arise, you're going to get some kind of notification actually of the inside being pushed to you as a farmer uh, through our platform or through whatever means is is is, is are way uh, more convenient. So the idea is that if any of those threatening situations arise, they get pushed to you timely enough that you can then act before um, a significant portion of the uh, yields are then threatened. I mean, historically, 90% uh, of potential threats have been eliminated uh, through our interaction like this. Obviously, there's other factors that come in regarding to you as a farmer having access to platforms to, for instance, spray your crops if you identify any pest, uh, or obviously, let's say, apply fertilizer if you identify any soil uh, deficiencies and, and, and the likes. But it's more of a quite an, an active engagement uh, between the team at Korai coming to your farm and collecting data, and you having access to that information quite timely uh, as, as well. So it's more of an active uh, engagement than us just coming once a year or once or once in, 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 in a few months. It's going to be a kind of a relationship that we're building. And just to understand correctly, Clive, I hear you saying just collecting data and we know what's uh, the regulations around the Poppy Act. So who keeps that data? Who owns that data? And when you're collecting the data for the farmer, are you providing recommendations on how the farmer can improve in his or her production? Or is it just collecting data, putting it in a format where 
a farmer could understand, whether it's in the form of graph, Excel spreadsheet, and maybe the farmer could take that information, sit with the agronomist, and then just start planning to say, where are we going right and where are we going wrong? So maybe just expand a little bit on that part. Uh, yeah, so when we, we speak of data, uh, the, there's obviously different levels, right, of the actual data. I mean, the data, the data itself gets transformed uh, through our processes into information, into knowledge, then eventually into wisdom, right? So you as the farmer on the right to the actual data and information, but then uh, the, the upper levels, which are the, the actual actionable insights that we give to you, um, that's a bit of a fuzzy area, right? Because that's, that, that's wisdom that we have developed over the past years. Uh, through our own experience and our own um, our own AI becoming smarter and smarter. So that's a bit of a fuzzy element on who really owns uh, the, the, the data. But the actual insights that we then push to you, uh, uh, it, it's something that you don't really then have to be able to, to make, to say, for instance, know how to uh, interpret an Excel graph or something like that. We try to eliminate all those uh, aspects for you as a farm. And that's why we call them actionable insights uh, or, or just discernment, right? So for um, for instance, what we then uh, give you as an output is a map with, let's say, red, green, and some kind of orange uh, um, areas, obviously those being portions of the farm. And it's a simple summary that says the red farms uh, are dehydrated. Now you have to basically apply some kind of... Um, I don't know, spraying whatever it is that you do, or the, the papal farms need uh, fertilizer to be applied at a rate of 30 kgs per ton. Now, we are trying to detach you from the actual analytics of giving you uh, graphs and spreadsheets and, and, and the likes. I mean, that's the job of a scientist, and that's basically what the, 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 the back-end team at Cora is doing, right? Trying to, to, to simplify the complex. Because all we need to do is to know what we're doing, and we act on that. And then the actual results get seen by the actual efficiency, the improvement uh, in the crop yields, uh, the improvement in you yourself as a farmer spending less money uh, in the actual fertilizer, in the actual pesticides, but you're realizing an increased yield uh, at the end of the day. Right. Before I move on to Sam, uh, Clive, I just want to ask you one last question here uh, with regards to what you've just said. So how many hectares what does one farmer have to have to be able to use Karai to make sure that the costs make business sense? What's the minimum starting or entry level uh, number of hectares that one would need to have in order to use Karai? I mean, there, there's no uh, limit in, in theory in terms of uh, what the size of the farm uh, can be. It can be a garden, it can be a one hectare farm, uh, it can be a 400 hectare farm. There they really is no limit, right? The, the only constraint that, that, that then come to play because of the physical aspects related to, to us going to a farm and uh, pretty much collecting data is, is then the, the, the aspect that then relates to the actual fixed cost of us going to the farm uh, and, and, and driving to the farm, right? And because of such reasons, we, we kind of then work with different models where if we have a number of small-scale farms, we kind of like aggregate them together and say on a particular Tuesday, we are going to reach in A with 20 farms, pretty much growing the same crop, right? I mean, there's a high chance that if it's in the same uh, a spot, then they're pretty much growing the same crop and they're at the same age. So because of those models that we then use, that then kind of not only saves the cost for us as a company, but also then reduces the cost of us saving you as a farm and hence the price that we charge on you. So I there's see. those particular models. And obviously you kind of get uh, situations where we're dealing with uh, your large scale farms and in that aspect is very much feasible for us to just come to your farm and collect the data. Got it, got it. Sam, moving on to you and with what Clavis just said, you know, that it's best to work with farmers who are uh, working um, together so that you could aggregate them to make sure that the, the flight or the drone process, the drone flying process is easier for you to collect data. But, you know, I know that uh, models like that typically work in, uh, in different regions within the African continent. But South Africa specifically is quite unique because there's a lot of small-scale farmers, um, you know, um, widely dispersed from a geographical point of view. And people, farmers who are farming as a collective or, you know, in a small community will typically be, be, will typically be farmers maybe who are part of a specific program, 
farmers who are part of a, a cooperative. So now, how are you solving the challenges around where uh, you're finding Mbali in, uh, in Gauteng, Mbali in uh, Limpopo, Mbali in Northwest, that um, maybe is farming maize, each on 50 hectares, but you have to physically go to their farm. So how are you, f- how are you dealing with the logistical or geographical challenges to say, um, this week I need to be at this person's farm, et cetera, especially if we're farming the same crop and the data or analysis needs to happen pretty much at the same time. So, uh, thank you. That's also a great question. And one of the b- biggest bottlenecks dealing with uh, small scale farms in, in the southern hemisphere, in southern Africa. Um, the way we deal with that is we work largely with cooperatives and organizations that are managing or work with these farms in particular and all their suppliers. And we try to collate all that information to schedule our flights and our monitoring trips as we visit these farms. We're also looking at another business model where we will then try to equip these local farmers to be able to fly uh, drones for themselves. I know big 4IR is a big talking point at the moment. Uh, Mm -hmm. Clev and I were privileged enough to go to aeronautical engineering and we worked a lot in the aerospace industry. So we understand a lot about flight dynamics, but we also want to um, empower or equip uh, people with, with the knowledge and know-how to handle um, such technology and to be able to do it for themselves. So um, our current model is that we would work with um, all the cooperatives and managing partners in how to facilitate the data capturing. But eventually mm-hmm. we want to get to the point where they will be able to do the flights and data collection for themselves. That was actually going to be my follow-up question to say, you know, just to limit the moving part between um, you two as the co-founders of Kurai, you know, could I just buy or, or, or rent out your drone, fly it on my, uh, on my farm, um, and then, you know, it's, it's collecting insights and gathering information, and then, you know, sit on a desktop, have a Zoom call like this, where both of you gentlemen could then just advise in terms of the type of information or data that I'm reading. So I wanted to know, the follow-up question was literally going to be, can one just fly the drone by themselves? And then you would obviously provide that advisory service uh, post-flight on what the data actually says or is, is, is reading. Okay, uh, just, just to add on that. So our... Our biggest problem with that is just the South African Civil Aviation Authority regulations. So um, in order for you to be able to do that for yourself, you're going to, by law, are required to have a drone pilot's license. The drone, uh, the aircraft needs to be registered with the Civil Aviation Authority as well. And as well as um, the company is going to need to have an operator's license called an ROC in order to operate in South Africa. So that's also uh, legally uh, a requirement that you're going to need to consider before being able to do that. But like I said, uh, we're working with partners and stakeholders, both in government, the Department of Transport, and the South African Civil Aviation Authority in order to expedite that process. Because um, it's a very simple procedure to follow. Um, This business model has been tested out. Uh, We have clients out in Africa. Uh, We're currently partnered in Lagos where um, farmers are doing the flying of uh, drones by themselves. And then they just send the data to us. We do the processing and give them back the insights. So the only biggest uh, speed hump is just legislation in South Africa. But as soon as that is caught up, yeah, that will be the way forward. Amazing, gentlemen. It sounds like you've just done so much research and development since you started Karai and really thought it through, you know, about the needs uh, that a farmer has and, you know, how can we perfect our systems on our farms. Clive, coming on to you, you know, as, as, as Sam was speaking, I remember that a part of your service offering not only provides aerial mapping um, and just obviously providing data on what you've just seen based on how high the drone flies, et cetera, and the information it captures. I know that part of your service offering also provides spraying 
So like there's a physical drone that you could use over your fields and it's spraying, um, correcting that specific part of, um, you know, the field, et cetera. Now, coming on to that, you know, um, there is also a lot of technology advancement where there are self-driven tractors, you know, that um, have boom sprayers at the back that maybe um, have a capacity to carry, let's say, I don't know, 200 liters and maybe cover hectares and hectares of, of land. So tell us about the technical specifications on your specific drone spraying. So how many liters can one, um, so, so how many liters can one flight hold and how many hectares can that cover it? Because what I'm trying to ask, find out here is how many times, so let's say I'm farming on 500 hectares, how many times would I have to have a drone flying to spray and I'm trying to compare versus a tractor, maybe they could drive itself, but has a capacity to maybe spray, has a, has a capacity to hold 200 liters and spray maybe, you know, all my hectares at a go. So how many, just give us the technical specifications around your drone uh, equipment, specifically on the spraying part, and how many hectares would one flight cover? Uh, thanks, Mbali, for, for that question. Uh, I mean, perhaps before I get to the actual technical uh, aspects in terms of the operational performance, uh, yeah. I think it's worth just mentioning generally why we initially uh, uh, embarked on this journey of literally designing and developing our own crop spraying drones. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, they, they should eventually... Uh, come live, I mean, within uh, the next few months, specifically because of the CAA regulations that uh, Sam, Sam mentioned. Mm. Um, so what, obviously, taking back again to our experience in the farming, uh, 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 I guess the farming uh, activities growing up, uh, you realize that uh, besides the actual information part, right, that we've been speaking um, about, I think, all up to this stage, uh, the other second biggest I guess, inefficiency that farmers have uh, pre-harvest, specifically for small and uh, medium-scale farms, is the actual access to, to infrastructure. So access to platforms that then perform the key activities that we need, right? Um, and you realize that if you basically break down all the activities, uh, the, the, well, one of the chief and really crucial ones is the actual crop spraying, uh, obviously then linked to the actual application of fertilizer. Um, and that's why we then embarked on this journey of designing and developing our crop spraying drones. And the primary reason was to define access uh, of these platforms to small and medium scale farms in a, in a way that obviously is affordable, but still does the job way more conveniently, right? Um, so, I mean, uh, a, a single drone, for instance, can be used by four or five uh, different farms in one particular day. Now, having a defined access, right, we then bring it down to uh, the, the I guess the, the fortunate um, uh, part that because of the access to tech and the decreased uh, cost actually of accessing technology, these drones are even way more efficient in applying, uh, it can be fertilizer or, or pesticides compared to, to your tractors and aircraft even, right? I mean, there's particular reasons for that. Um, it, it's a system that basically flies low enough. We usually fly like two, three meters above, above the crop. Uh, so the actual pesticides, the actual droplets are applied to, uh, to the crop surface way more efficiently. So obviously speaking of uh, 20 to 30% are savings in just the pesticides. But now the biggest element of the actual savings, the efficiency comes, comes in when, uh, when you couple the actual data analytics and the actual application. So I'll give you a scenario. We, we fly in a 10 hectare farm. We realize that only 0 0.5 hectares is, uh, a, a, is affected by a pest. So now we need to uh, spray that portion, right? Ideally with a tractor or any, any other platform, you come in basically dump chemicals in the 10 hectares. Now with the actual drone, because it's also data driven, it knows where it is to every square centimeter in the farm. What we just do is take a prescription map from our analytics, upload it to the drone, and it pretty much goes, uh, goes exactly where the, the, uh, the, the infection is, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously it deals with it much more quicker, but also it means you have saved 9.5 hectares worth of chemical. Now that's 
uh, that's a huge 95% savings in that uh, given scenario. You've spent less money, but you've also obviously dealt with uh, a, a given threat. Now let's go to the specifications of these actual drones, right? Um, and I guess one of the most, and something worth really mentioning is the actual uh, spray rate rate in terms of how much you can cover at a given time. So our current platforms, uh, if I obviously mention it in terms of the number of hectares per day, speaking of something like between 45 and 50 hectares per given day, depending on the terrain and the complexity of the farm. Um, now, uh, the, the platform itself can carry up to 16 uh, liters at a given time. Now, that might sound uh, quite, quite small, right? But then if you look at the actual rate and the speed at which this platform covers, you then realize that you can easily just um, replace the payload just like that. So uh, in any given hour, we're talking of uh, close to 100 liters of chemical being applied uh, to, to a given crop, right? Obviously, there's scenarios where if you are doing uh, quite some heavy spraying, where it really becomes impractical at this stage. So we cannot, for instance, apply 300 liters per hectare. So there are those scenarios where we say, you know what, we can just advise and uh, identify areas that are infected, but we, we, we then detach ourselves from the actual uh, spraying. Mm -hmm. Our platforms are not yet at that stage. But for any uh, medium to uh, ultralight spraying rates, anything <laughs> below 60 liters per hectare, the drone is by far the most efficient platform to use. Great. I like the fact that you mentioned that the drone goes low enough to be close enough to the crop to spray because we've seen some commercial farmers and farmers just, let's just say established farmers who are farming in uh, hundreds of hectares using uh, helicopters to spray. And I've always asked myself, like, you know, that uh, the whatever chemicals mm -hmm. they're spraying is obviously getting blown by the wind. You know, yeah. even, if you, even if you're on a um, you're spraying on a day that is not so windy, but you kind of see that the chemicals moving away to the side, um, you know, and um, I like the fact that the drone just fly hovers just low enough to the mm. crop to spray a specific area. So therefore, you know, we, you, I, I suppose you as a farmer, if you're using that uh, uh, a method, you're not doing preventative spraying, you know, you're not just spraying a blanket approach, you're spraying to fix a certain problem at a certain space. So you're obviously saving on chemical costs, et cetera, fertilizer costs, if needs be. Jenny, Mom, this sounds like a fantastic business that you've built. Um, and I'm sure it's not the last that we hear from you from the farming podcast um, and just in, in, in the industry at large. And um, hopefully a lot more farmers could use um, this technology and also understand the, 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 the importance of using data on the farms because I was speaking speaking to a group of farmers today to tell them that you know data is so important even if you're seeking finance even if you're trying to understand the yields per hectare on your farm you need data to make that informed decision and when investors want to invest in your business they want to know how much how much can you produce at which seasons uh, at which different seasons um, and the reasons why you're producing that so you know farming is definitely a business but I just want to know if from, from having incorporated Kirai, um, what have been some of the milestones or the accomplishments uh, that you guys have achieved thus far and the biggest learnings? You know, sometimes, you know, entrepreneurs like yourself develop a product or a service thinking that farmers might need this. But when you actually go and trial run the actual product or the service, you find that, oh, there's a lot of tweaks and changes that we need to make because what we thought does not really translate into reality. So just to sum off the show, because I, we are running out of time, just a quick one. Maybe either of you could answer either of the two questions to say, firstly, what have been some of the milestones and accomplishments having started uh, uh, Kurai? And then also what have been the biggest learnings uh, bringing Kurai into the farmers and uh, once the farmers have used the product or uh, yeah, your, 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 your service offering, what have been the biggest learnings? So what have been the biggest learnings and what have been your accomplishments since you guys started? Um, I'll let you decide who answers okay. which. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take that one about the biggest learnings. I think Great. so far we were kind of privileged because we both came from um, uh, an extensive farming background. So we had a lot of insight, but we also, on the other hand, had a, a third eye, if you may call it that, being outside the industry. So being aero engineers, we could give them um, 
we could show them something that they never thought of or something that they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that was very, um, also a big uh, hump, a speed hump, trying to convince people that the technology does work, to believe and trust in the process. It took a very long time, but eventually a lot of people came around because their results spoke for themselves. So I think that was our biggest, biggest challenge. Um, yes. Thank you. Clive? I think for me, when it comes to the, I guess, the accomplishments, just generally being able to have produced a really amazing product. Um, I mean, um, not amazing in the sense from an engineering perspective. We love engineering. I love drones. Um, obviously, uh, amazing in that respect, right? But I mean, I'll, I could possibly point to two or three uh, scenarios where we, we just see the light in the um, the face of a farmer, right? Uh, initially by them just like seeing this tech. So I guess they say the crop spraying drone, just seeing the drone hovering and flying up and down, the amazement, but also uh, 30, 40 minutes down the line when this drone is sprayed five uh, to six uh, hectares and how they are so thrilled, but at the same time, um, it's like they have this fulfillment in them that, mm -hmm. Prior to this, right, in this particular scenario, I just spent 40 minutes of my time and this, uh, this thing has been, um, has been finished, Compa comparing that to the pain that they, um, they usually feel, right, of trying to hire a tractor for the day, spend mm -hmm. three or four hours uh, up and down with the tractor, possibly missing spots. I mean, that's a, a scenario that we've had quite a while where they miss spots with tractors and things. I mean, that j just a farm seeing the fulfill uh, fulfillment between the two scenarios, and then just loving the insights we're providing to them and acting and immediately, almost immediately in, in, in some cases, seeing uh, the, the, the impact uh, that uh, the service is defined. Like that for me is just fulfilling. Right. Beautifully fulfilling. Yeah. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time this evening. I thoroughly appreciate our conversation. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best with your business and your service offering. I guess I hope that, uh, you know, from this conversation, we get more farmers curious about how do they incorporate data into their farms to make strategic decisions for the next season, for the next planting cycle, etc. cetera. And um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and your experience and the reasoning behind uh, uh, incorporating Karai. But thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much, Bali. You really had a great time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. That was Clive Mate and Sam Mateche from Karai, the co-founders of Karai, which is an agri-tech startup incorporated in 2018. And they were talking about uh, data-driven farming. And the data pretty much comes from the service that they offer to farmers using drone technology to do aerial mapping of the farm to identify any unwanted pests and diseases on your crops. Um, it could be used for short-term crops, vegetables, long-term crops, you know, and uh, it's not specific to the size of the farm, but what the technology does really is help you identify the problem areas in your farm and you specifically tackle those specific areas. At the end of the day, cutting you costs, uh, saving you costs uh, from a fertilizer consumption, insecticide consumption, and I think another one, a petrol or diesel consumption, you know, uh, because when you use boom sprays, you have to always buy petrol or diesel and two-stroke oil. And so, you know, I think what's great about their technology, it's really tackles the most critical and um, uh, problematic areas on the farm instead of having to, you know, use a blanket approach in your entire production. If you'd like to reach out to the gentlemen, um, go to their website, Kurai, K-U-R-A-I. Um, I don't know, is that .com or .co.za, Clive? Uh, just .co. Okay, Karai. so Kurai.co, go onto the website. They have um, all the uh, services and you know, uh, the journey around the business and what they offer to the farmers, information that you need right there and their contact details. So thank you so much for watching on to the show. Um, I will catch you on Thursday, 8 p.m. And um, looking forward to the guests that we'll have then and for you to um, also engage and interact with uh, the upcoming episode. But thank you so much for supporting the podcast. And you could catch us on YouTube if you missed this uh, conversation tonight. That's it for me. Take care.